He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. Some of you know that my family lived in the Second World War period of history in Germany. My father used to always say that they lived on the wrong side of the ocean at the wrong time in Earth's history. And uh, out of that came many, many experiences of God's providences. I'm going to share some stories this morning that some of you who have read the book A Thousand Shall Fall may recognize, some of you may not, because I tell them differently. I tell them the way my father and my grandfather told them to me, and in a book they have to be often shortened because you have to fill a lot of stories in a book. Um, I will also share a story or two that you may not have heard before. A few years ago, I was speaking at Lake Junaluska camp meeting for the Carolina Conference, and I was taking a walk around the lake with one of my uncles, not an uncle that is related to me by blood relation, but an uncle that is related to me through marriage. He also grew up in the Second World War in Eastern Europe in a small German community, and I asked him, he asked me the question as we were walking around the lake, what do you think I wished for? more than anything else as a child during those war years. And I, he was very good. He didn't give me the answer. (laughs) He wanted me to guess as long as I could. So I think we walked around the whole lake, and it wasn't until the very end that he finally told me, because I couldn't figure it out. I, I, I guessed the most common things. I was thinking about the mind of a child, so I thought, toys? Oh, no, not that. Food? No. Um, A safe place? No. My mind went from specifics to more generalities. I said, peace? No. Well, kind of, but be more specific. Finally, after going through many, many guesses, he stopped on the, on, the, on the pathway, and he looked at me, and he said, it was only one thing. I wished for one night of uninterrupted sleep. One night where the air raid sirens were not going off, and we had to run to a shelter. One night without hearing the bombers overhead. One night without the bombs, and the bombs making the noise, and then the explosion that rocked our world. One night of uninterrupted sleep. Can you imagine growing up for six years with that thought in your mind? My Uncle Billy is not with us any longer. He's sleeping in Jesus now. But I'll never forget that walk around the lake. We have no idea what our relatives, what our countrymen went through during those years. We grew up in a peaceful country, most of us. We grew up in a place where we could experience freedom of worship. We grew up in a place where we had great things to to look forward to, but that is not the case in many part of Earth's history, and we know that at the end of time, which is now the time in which we are living, that will not be the case either. One night of uninterrupted sleep. One night the siren went off. There were two sirens, warning sirens, in the city of Frankfurt where my grand where my grandparents and where my father was growing up. My dad was born in nineteen thirty five, which meant that with the war starting in 1939, when he was about four years old, he was 10 when the war ended, his earliest memories and his childhood until the age of 10 was war-torn years. So my father told me this story. It's not in the book. He said, we heard 
the air raid sirens. There were two sirens. One was the siren that gave you more time. I don't remember exactly how much time, but it was the siren that gave you more time, and it went something like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He said you, you had about five minutes to get to an air raid shelter. And then there was the last-minute siren where you didn't have much time at all. And it went something like this. Ooh, 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 ooh. He says, when you heard that siren, you could already hear the planes. And he said, us kids, we needed to know. We knew the sound of every engine on every plane that existed at that time in history that flew over Germany. We had to know whether it was a Messerschmitt plane made by Germans or whether it was a bomber that was coming from Britain or whether it was an American plane, we had to know our planes. It was a matter of survival. We had to know what was overhead. And he said, on this particular occasion, the last of those sirens went off, and we could already hear the drones of the planes. And we knew that the bombs were not far behind, so we rushed down into the air raid shelter, which was in our building. We rushed down, and there were three things in the air raid shelter. There was a pile of sand, there were buckets of water, and there were piles of blankets. The buckets of water and the blankets, the blankets were not to sleep there at night. The blankets were there, and the water was there. In case the building was hit and there was fire, you dip the blankets in the water, you put the blankets over you, and you would rush out and try to avoid uh, getting consumed or burnt by the flames. The sand was there in case there were phosphorus bombs because the water wasn't going to put that out and so hopefully the sand would help somewhat. But he says we would sit in the air raid shelter, all of us, with our hands in our ears, our fingers in our ears, with our mouths wide open and breathing and looking at each other. Some of us would have our eyes closed praying but we would be sick because you did not, you needed to keep breathing. We were told to keep breathing. You did not want to hold your breath when those bombs hit because the concussions could cause lung damage. Just like a diver coming up from 50 feet below the water, holding, you don't want to hold your breath going up, right? So those concussions were, could be very, very dangerous. So there they were. They were sitting in the air raid shelter. They had their ears plugged. They were praying when they heard one of the bombers having a different sound than all the other bombers. It was making a sputtering sound. And it had been hit by some of the anti-aircraft guns. And it, one of the engines had gone out, and it was coming in for a crash landing. It was coming in for a crash landing. It sounded like in the open field that was behind their apartment building on the outskirts of Frankfurt, it was coming in right there. And as this bomber was coming closer and closer, what is the first thing that you do if you're in a crashing plane coming down, a bomber plane coming down? What do you want to do before you crash land? You want to get rid of the belly full of bombs that might explode on that crash landing. So as this bomber was coming in, he was letting go his payload. And they could hear the bombs falling and exploding and as they heard those bombs coming closer and closer, they knew that one of those bombs could very well hit directly their building. And they began to pray. And they prayed. They prayed out loud. And they asked the Lord to protect them. Because while they were in an air raid shelter in an apartment building that is down in the basement, and that air raid shelter had been built to withstand shrapnel and that kind of thing, but it was not built to withstand a direct hit by a bomb. And so as that plane came down and they braced themselves, as the bombs kept getting closer and closer, and as they kind of figured in their minds, this one is going to be it, they closed their eyes, they braced themselves, it hit. They were thrown across the room, and when they opened their eyes, the plane they could hear had landed on the other side of their building and they were still alive and they were looking at each other in bewilderment wondering what had just happened. The bomb had hit, but they were still there. 
They ran outside, my dad being the youngest of the two brothers, his older brother Kurt, ran outside and right next to the wall of that building, right next to the wall of the air raid shelter, just a meter away, three feet away or so, was a huge gaping hole. And at the bottom of that hole was a bomb that had not exploded. The bomb that would have taken them out easily because it was right there next to them. And they looked at it, and they were all surprised. What's going on here? And as they looked at that bomb, as the bomb squad was called, the bomb squad came, everybody was evacuated. They carefully pulled that bomb out of its location. They carefully put it on its side. They began to unscrew or do whatever they needed to do to deactivate the bomb. And as they did that, finally the the, the green signal was given and everybody was able to come back and boys being boys, my, my, my dad and his brother, they came around and they said, yeah, talk, started talking to the guys that defused the bomb. What did you find? Why did that bomb not go off? And the guy said, well, we've defused a lot of bombs during the last few years, but this one, we've never seen anything like it. Well, what happened? Somebody didn't want this bomb to go off. What do you mean? Well, on the trigger mechanism between the, the pin and the detonator, somebody had taken a piece of paper, folded it up in four parts, very small, and stuck it between the pin and the detonator. Really? Who do you think did that? I have spent my whole childhood and adult life wondering who did that. Any of you ever go to Volkswagen, that area, you know? Volkswagen, I have to pronounce it the correct way. Okay, ever go, but I go to the Volkswagen plant and walk through the wonderful trails there. Anybody ever do that? You ever see the bunkers there? Ever been inside the bunkers and sung in the beautiful, uh, you know, acoustics that are there? You know what those bunkers used to hold? Bombs that went to Germany. Kind of ironic now that Volkswagen built a billion dollar plant right there. <laughs> anyway, thought about that a few times. But who was building those bombs? So anyway, I've, I've gone through scenarios in my mind. You know, could it have been one of the, because the men were out fighting, so the ladies were often working in the factories here at home. So could it have been that, that some lady didn't want that particular bomb to go off months earlier when that was constructed here in the United States? And she placed a piece of paper right there. And that was the bomb that landed. Or in my imagination as a child, I thought, was it an angel flying through the air like Superman? Unscrewing that bomb, sticking that piece of paper in there, screwing it back up and letting it drop. Could have happened that way, right? Or maybe God just thought in his mind, I'm hearing those prayers down there. Boom! Boom! There's paper right there. That bomb's not going off. By the way, today as they do construction work in cities all across Germany, they're finding undetonated bombs all the time. And they still have bomb squads coming to undetonate them. I don't know how it happened, but my family was convinced that that was a direct answer to their prayer that day. When 9-11 happened... Well, just a few days ago, we commemorated that event, or at least thought about that event, right? When 9-11 happened, my aunt, who is my mother's sister, who lives now in Michigan, wonderful lady, she said something very direct, as Germans sometimes do very directly. If you know Germans, you know sometimes they speak very directly. Um, don't mince words, and I told her that she should never share this anywhere in public, and here I'm sharing it with you. But this is what she said when that happened in 2001. I still remember sitting with her in her living room when she said this. Michael, 9-11 was nothing. I said, what do you mean? You can't say that. Thousands of people died. It was a huge thing. Every year, my wife leads an art appreciation tour to New York, and we go to Ground Zero with the students, and we go through the museum there, and we look at the, uh, the, the names that are there. It was something. 
something that had never happened on this soil before. She says, no, you don't understand. She says, when I was growing up, it wasn't a couple of buildings. It was entire cities that were gone. Entire cities. Devastated by the war. In Hamburg, Germany, on two nights, British planes coming across. They call it the Nagasaki of Germany. Two nights, 20,000 civilians died each night of those bombings. That was one city. After the war, of course, it was the rebel ladies. It's a German term for that. I think that's the best translation. That would go out and basically collect the bricks from the rubble for the rebuilding process to begin again. It was a horrible time of Earth's history. And some of you have read this book. That's my grandfather. Maybe you can see a little bit of the resemblance. I'm told there's some resemblance there. I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, I knew him very well. And there he is sitting with my grandmother with their three children. That was before Susie was born who wrote the book. And my dad is the one on the right-hand side sitting on his dad's lap. He was the youngest boy in the story. Uh, his name was Gerhard or Gat. And um, Kurt is in the middle. Kurt is a retired evangelist and pastor, uh, just turned 90 this year, living in Germany still there in southern Bavaria. And Lutte, sitting on her mother's lap, is uh, in California, in southern California, where she, she married an American GI afterwards and came to this country. A very smart move, I thought. Um, and my uh, father came a few years later uh, to study English and ended up in this country, met my mom, who was also a refugee from World War II here in this country, and uh, they made a new life for themselves here. We, we serve a wonderful, we have a wonderful country here, by the way, where that opportunity exists, and uh, my family was able to have a new life here that they probably wouldn't have had in the same way in Germany at all and we're able to serve God in, in wonderful ways here in this country. Um, these are some pictures I recently found, and that's before the war, out in some field with beautiful flowers behind them. Look at the smiles on everybody's faces. Same kids, same order, same parents. Um, and then this is during the war. Not as many smiles as you can see. It was a difficult time. My aunt, Susie, who wrote the book, who's not pictured here because she was a war baby. She was born during the war. My aunt showed me a picture of my grandmother before the war and after the war. My grandmother was only in her 40s at the end of the war. She looked like she was in her 60s. She had aged so much during the trauma and stress of that experience. Hitler's promises for Germany were great. Hitler's promises after the defeat of World War I and after the defeat of all of these uh, experiences, after the, um, the uh, Great Depression, uh, was to build up Germany and make it a great nation once again. And it was an amazing thing that, that boggles many people's minds that such a thing was possible. You can see here people with the Nazi salute as uh, Hitler has just given his speech at the Reichstag, as, at the Congress, the German Congress, and uh, there he is uh, standing there. Um, my grandmother refused on the streets of Frankfurt and wherever she was to give that Nazi salute. That became the standard way of saying hello to people. She was very polite but she would not be politically correct. She would say good morning. She would say good afternoon, good evening. She would never raise her arm and say Heil Hitler, ever. It was a stance that she took privately and that she kept publicly. Not an easy thing to do when you're in a totalitarian regime where something like that could be interpreted as not being patriotic and could even be punishable by death. Hitler promised that families would have priority and of course he had a concept of the purity of the German race and the superiority of the German race and so family and the propagation of a pure race 
based on eugenics and based on evolutionary thinking was very much at the core of what Hitler's ideas were and, and what his other people uh, were thinking as well. This was evolution played out in its logical conclusion. The masses were addressed with the latest, the radio. Everybody, by the way, was promised a Volksradio. Don't have to translate that, a Volksradio. By the way, did you see the previous slide there? Volksgenossen. You see the word Volks there? Have you heard of a Volkswagen before? Okay. Everybody was promised a Volkshaus. I don't have to translate that. Folk, by the way, is our word. F-O-L-K. It's the same word in German. A folks house. Everybody was promised a folks house. Everybody was promised a job. Everybody was promised a folks radio. That was like giving everybody a 4K brand new, you know, flat screen, 65 inch TV, or is it 80 inch now? I don't know what the latest is. Everybody got the latest technology. Everybody was going to have what what they needed. Big promises were being made. Rallies were held. Nationalism was on the rise. Fascism was on the rise. Hitler's Major opponent was communism, socialism. Very interesting that we're seeing very similar things being played out even in our country today in some ways. Dividing the country and then uniting it again under some new system. This is a color picture of some of these flags. I was at a camp meeting some years ago and someone gave me a present sent me a present afterwards as I told these stories, and it was an authentic flag like that. He had been a a, a soldier, an American soldier, and had picked up one of these flags at the end of the war, and it was an authentic flag. I don't even know where it is anymore. I think I hid it somewhere and forgot where I hid it because I don't want that flag to be seen anywhere. In Germany, if you show a flag like that, you go to jail today. It does not a symbol of hope or of goodness at all. Do you know what it says on the flag? Germany, wake up. Germany, wake up, rise up. That's what it says. One people, one empire, one leader. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. This was what Hitler and his henchmen were promising. This is my grandfather's um, passport as he took that through the war. My grandfather was drafted into the war at the age of 40. He had served in World War I as a teenager. He was born in 1899. By the age of 17, he was drafted into the German army and served in the last year of World War I. He got out of the war in 1918 at the age of 18, 18 and a half or so. He had been a sharpshooter. He was not a believer at that time. He grew up in a Catholic family, but through evangelistic meetings that his mother brought him to and trying to prove the preacher wrong on the issue of the Sabbath, my grandfather became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian in his early 20s. Now at the age of 40, he was a minister of the gospel, a call porter, someone who had dedicated his life to the proclamation of the gospel. And at the age of 40, with this new uh, uh, regime... He was one of the first to be called up to serve because he had experience from the First World War. But my grandfather's whole mindset had changed. He had experienced what it was like in the First World War. He knew the horrors of war. And as now a Bible-believing Christian, he made a decision that he was not going to be involved in the same way. That is his name there. This is, by the way, the documents. He was the clerk of the unit, and these are the original individuals that were in that unit. There were 1,200 of them in the original unit that served at the beginning. My grandfather is pictured here among some of the fellow soldiers. This is at the beginning of the war when they were uh, stationed uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, And then here you can see him in the back of the picture there. That's him there as well with some of the other officers here. Most of those officers did not survive the war. My grandfather refused to carry a weapon during the war. At a time when a conscientious objector status was not possible, 
He was a believer in God's commandments, and he believed that when it said, Thou shalt not kill, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, in the Decalogue, that that's what God meant. And so what he decided to do, he knew how to use a weapon. He had been a sharpshooter in World War I. What he did is when they were stationed in France at the beginning of the war, he went to a small little country village where they were stationed and sought out a woodcarver and had an exact replica of a his pistol made, which he placed in a holster like this one, which had a nice flap that uh, camouflaged it, if you will, and that's what he carried with him through six years of the war. No weapon, none whatsoever. I asked my grandfather once why, and he said this. He says, Michael, he says, we as Christians have been called to proclaim the life of Jesus Christ, and to encourage others to experience that life with him. He says, what if there's another fellow Christian on the other side, in the Russian side, or on the French side, or the American side? What if that person is another minister like I am, serving his country, not wanting to, but having to under the circumstances? What if that, would I take the life of another person? Not knowing who that person is, not knowing that person's family, that's not what God is about. God want, has called us to save lives, not to take lives. But what about your family? What about defending your family? Michael, God defends the family. We have to be faithful to what he's asked us to do and leave the rest to him. Well, that's how my grandfather went through the war. Trying to go forward here. Oh, it's going forward several times here, sorry. They built bridges. That's him in the foreground. This is a huge bridge across the uh, river. The bridges would often be uh, completely wiped out. He was on the southern flank of the Operation Barbarossa, which went into, uh, the, uh, into Russia, uh, the, 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 eastern, the eastern front. Hitler would have not... Hitler would have won the war had he not invaded Russia, for sure. That was a big mistake because he was already successful. He had taken over France in no time. He had taken over Poland. He had taken over Austria. He had taken over much of Europe. Why Russia? Stop, you know, but he didn't stop. And so with his armies divided on two fronts and with the winter coming on in Russia, which my grandfather survived, it was another story. And, uh, and that was the downfall of, of Hitler. Here you can see uh, one of the bombed out bridges that the Russians bombed out to keep the Germans from advancing. So they had to build their own bridges. These pontoon bridges were built often overnight if it was a smaller river and sometimes over several days if it was a larger liver, river. You can see the, the, the bombed out bridge in the background and you can see the pontoon bridge in the foreground. And it was here that, that the Germans were able to. So he was an, engin in, an engineering unit that engineered these bridges, and they were very, very well crafted. Some of those bridges, by the way, still serve, not the pontoon bridges, but some of the permanent bridges they built still serve today uh, in that part of the world. Here is a downed fighter plane my grandfather is posing next to. We found these pictures a few years ago, and my uncle was moving from one part of Germany to the other and during his retirement, and suddenly there was a box of pictures there that he didn't know he had. My grandfather was the clerk of the unit, and he had kept track of all of these pictures, and he had kept the ones that had him in it, threw away the rest. They had to get rid of all the documents at the end of the war. This is a funeral in the woods. By the way, copiously annotated on the back of these pictures by my grandfather's hand with dates, specific dates. And this is uh, a funeral in the woods. There were a lot of those as they were marching into the heart of Russia, 25 miles a day. One day, my grandfather was very, very discouraged. And he asked the Lord for something after years. Hitler promised that the war would be over in a short time. But after years, he was very discouraged. And he asked, my, he asked God that God would give him some kind of an indication that he would make it through this experience and that his family would make it through this experience. He hadn't heard from his family in months. He had just been issued a new pair of boots. How many of you ever have had a new pair of boots? Do you go on a 30-mile hike in a new pair of boots? No. Why not? They're not broken in, right? 
So I have a brand new pair of shoes. I've been wearing them a little bit around the garden and around the yard and walking because I'm not going on a full hike on them yet. Um, But he was given a brand new pair of leather boots, but he had no choice but to hike 30 kilometers the next day. Because if you weren't hiking, you see they had horses, they had a couple of motorized vehicles, but they were marching. Most of the men were marching, and if you didn't march and if you didn't keep up, you would be left behind, and if you would be left behind, that meant being captured by the Russians, and that was the worst possible thing that the Germans feared, almost even more than death itself. So my grandfather at the end of that day was in so much pain, as he took off his boots, his feet were a bloody mess. He told me later that some of the blisters were this big, the size of silver dollars. He says they were... They had popped, of course, and he said it was after he got his boots off, his feet swelled up so big that he couldn't get his boots on again. He had his friend help him hobble to a little brook that was there, and he placed his feet in the cold water for some relief. But he knew the next day if he was not going to get his boots on, and if he was not able to march with the other men, he would be left behind, and it would be all over for him. He'd be captured by the Russians, and so... That night he prayed, and he asked, Lord, please, you know I need to march tomorrow. You know that this is what we have to do every single day, and if I don't march tomorrow, you know what the results will be. Please, Lord, help me tonight. He had forgot about the prayer a few days earlier for a sign, but that night as he fell asleep with sore feet, he fell asleep as the men all fell asleep every night, exhausted after that long march. The next morning he woke up, The first thought on his mind was his feet. And he reached down through the covers and he felt his feet and his feet didn't hurt. In fact, his feet didn't feel swollen. He was surprised as he threw off the covers and he looked and his feet were perfectly intact as if nothing had happened the day before. In fact, there wasn't even a blister, there was not a scar, there was nothing. It was as if his feet had just been revitalized by some fancy foot massage with all kinds of fancy creams. Or There was no sign of anything. He looked at his feet in astonishment, he put his boots back on, his friend saw his feet, he was like, what happened? And my grandfather says, I serve a God in heaven who is faithful and who answers prayer. That day he marched, that next day, by the way, I guess his boots were broken in the day before. He never had a problem with his feet again. He continued to march and continued to wear those boots. Here they are marching. On one of these pictures, not this one, my grandfather has a little red arrow showing where he is on the lineup of men. They arrived at a village, and they had captured this village, and they were staying in the schoolhouse, and one night... As they were there in this, uh, briefly at this, uh, at this Ukrainian village, suddenly um, he woke up in the morning with a strange sound, a buzzing sound. Bzzz, bzzz. First he thought it might be a bee buzzing around or a mosquito buzzing around his head, and he was swatting it kind of half awake, half asleep, but it wasn't inside the building, he realized. It was coming from outside the building. He didn't recognize the sound, so he carefully got up. He crept over the soldiers that were there um, sleeping on the floor, and he went across the street where the Russians had built a large lookout tower. And he climbed up to the top of the lookout tower, and he looked out in the direction of the sound, and his heart nearly stopped because coming across the hills towards that little village were hundreds of Russian T-34 tanks, an entire battalion of tanks. My grandfather knew they had one or two tanks, Tiger tanks that were much more effective than any Russian or American tank, but two tanks are no match for hundreds of Russian tanks. And so he, 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 he ran down that lookout tower as fast as he could, ran across the street, flung open the door of the schoolhouse and said, get up, get up, the Russians are coming now, get up, take your things, get out. And everybody jumped up, grabbed what they could, grabbed the things they could have, and they ran for their lives. And at that moment, my grandfather remembered, wait a minute, I'm the clerk, not that he didn't know that, but I'm in charge of all the secret code books, all the commands that we get from Berlin and everything. I've got got all the secret code books, and they were in a little closet off to the side, and 
And there was no time to gather up those code books, but there was no way the Russians could get a hold of those code books because then he would lose, he would be, it, life would be over for my grandfather. That would be it. That would be like high treason if he lost those to- code books. So in that moment, he's thinking, what do I do? Lord, what do I do? And at that moment, an a idea came and he grabbed a piece of chalk from the chalkboard. This was a classroom. He grabbed a piece of chalk from the chalkboard. He took his key. He locked the door. And then with big, big, a big skull he drew on the, on the door and then two crossbones underneath, underneath and then he wrote, Danger, do not enter. And he ran out only to find everybody was gone. They were gone. All of, his, all of his fellow comrades were gone. He saw one last vehicle moving slowly, pulling a heavy trailer behind it. And this is where my aunt destroyed the story. Because the way I grew up hearing the story was that it was a tank pulling a heavy piece of artillery. And my aunt in her book said it was a truck pulling a trailer. And I'm sorry, but when you're a little boy, a tank is a tank and a truck is a truck. And a truck is not as impressive as a tank. So it destroyed the story for me. And I'm like, how is this possible? How could she put this in the book? It was a tank. So I asked my uncle, the older Kurt, you know, the, the one who, who was 15 when the war ended, had a good memory of things. I said, Kurt, Tante Susie, Tante means aunt in German, Tante Susie wrote, it was a truck. Opa, all, Opa is grandpa. Opa always said it was a tank. How could this be? He says, they were both right. No, it can't be. He said, yes, they were both right. I said, wait a minute. I know you believe in truth and not the relativity of truth and pluralism. Tell me you can't, this is not right. He says, no, it was a tank truck. You want to see it? Then he showed me this picture. That's what it was. You see that tank truck at the front? It's got wheels like a truck in the front. It's got tracks like a tank in the back. It's, uh, it, they had tons of these vehicles. These were their heavy moving vehicles. And look at it, it's pulling a heavy trailer with a tank on it. Now that wasn't the one that my, this is just a model, you know, from a model People, people buy these models and make models and stuff, you know. So this was out of a catalog or something. But I thought, man, what an illustration. So I took a picture of it. I scanned it, actually scanned it in, and I have it now for my illustration. So that, that's what he was aiming for, something like that. Okay, he was running for his life. And my grandfather said it was about 100 meters off, about 100 yards off. And he says, I ran for my life. Michael, I know I broke all records for the 100-meter dash that day. I said, Grandpa, how do you, was somebody timing you? He says, no, nobody needed to time me. I know I did. I said, how do you know you did? I said, he says, because in the Olympics, in these races, they're just running for a medal. I was running for my life. I ran as fast as I could, and I didn't quite make it to that tank truck. But I made it to the hitch connecting the truck with the vehicle behind it. I made it to that hitch, and I sat down on the hitch. And at that moment, just like in this picture... That, tr- that tank made a very, very sharp turn. And as it made a sharp turn, I didn't have anything to hold on to on that hitch. I fell backwards. The wind was knocked out of me as I hit the ground. And as I turned my head, the heavy wheel of that wagon with that piece of artillery was coming straight for my head. And I knew that my head would be crushed and my life was over. He said, at that moment, my entire life flashed before me as a giant movie from my childhood all the way to that moment in history. He says, it was all there. In a split instance, I saw my life flash before me and all I had time to say in my mind was, Lord, save me and my family. And at that moment, I felt somebody grab me. Somebody grabbed me from behind on my shirt, yanked me up from underneath that vehicle lifted me up high in the air. And by the way, that tank truck thing was, you know, was covered. It had a gun turret on it as well. And, 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 and lifted me up and placed me in the middle of that, on the top of the roof of that truck, that tank truck. And he says, and there I sat. Out of breath still from having the wind knocked out of me, I turned around to thank the person that saved my life, and there was no one there. And then I looked down into the cockpit, you know, in, in the vehicle where the, the men were sitting that were driving it, and they said, Hazel, what are you doing here? And he says, I knew that the angel of the Lord was with me that day. Psalm 91, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands 
lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra. The young lion and the serpent will trample you down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. That was my favorite story growing up, one of my favorite stories. Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Do you have that peace today? In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all the adjustments that we're going through, in the midst of the unknowns for the future, are you at peace because you know that you have a God who is your refuge and your strength a very present help in trouble? Well, my grandfather was on the front lines. My grandmother was on the home front with three children, later four children, during the war in a very difficult set of circumstances with the bombs dropping and with um, a lot of uncertainty. Her husband would come home maybe once a year for furlough, and then he would leave again, and they wouldn't hear from each other in months. There was no FedEx, there was no UPS, there was no DHL, there was no overnighting anything. Getting letters to the front lines and getting letters back was a very difficult thing. One day there was a loud knock on the door. (laughs) Kurt, the oldest, went to open the door, and as he opened the door, there was a very fine-looking gentleman wearing a civilian suit, kind of like I am here. He had this little small pin in his lapel. That's an actual pin, by the way. This pin was in his lapel, and he had an armband around his, his uh, arm in red and black and white, the same colors you see there with a the swastika right in the center of it. And he said very kindly and very friend, in a very friendly voice, is your mother home? And Kurt said, yes, she's working in the kitchen. Well, may I speak with her, please? So Kurt went to get his mother, my grandmother, and she went out and ushered the children into the kitchen while she had a conversation with this gentleman in the living room. When the conversation was over, she came into the kitchen. The man had left, and she said, Children, we have to pray. You see, this gentleman was a member of the Nazi party, and we have just been invited to join the Nazi party. Our family has. Your father and I have. This is a very, very serious situation. You see, in those days, you didn't join a, a particular political party. There were many parties. Uh, you couldn't just join the Nazi party at that time in history. Earlier on, you could, but not at that time. You were invited to join the Nazi party. And if you were invited, it was considered a privilege because this was the party that was in control of the country. To refuse to become a member of the Nazi party, once invited, was the equivalent of high treason. To be a member of the Nazi party meant that you received twice as many rations as everyone else did. For children, that meant two pairs of shoes a year instead of one pair of shoes. For people who were, you know, needing food, it meant twice as much food. Everything was rationed out this way. And you were invited to the best events in the campus, I mean, in the, in the, in the country and in the, in the city that you lived in. So they lived in the city of Frankfurt. That meant you got invited to the opera. You got invited to, and my grandmother, by the way, had been a professional singer before she became an Adventist. You got invited to all kinds of concerts. You were part of the elite in the city. So there were privileges if you joined, but there were also consequences if you refused. And my grandmother was caught between a rock and a hard place. So she said, she had prayed about it, and she told the children this, I told the gentleman that I never make a major decision in life without consulting my husband first. It's a good thing to have, I think. Men, it's a good thing to have that about your wives as well, right? Good thing, not to make a major decision without consulting with your 
most important person in your life. So she says, I don't make a decision like this lightly. I need to consult my husband, and I will give you an answer once I hear back from him. So she immediately after he left, the next day she wrote a letter to her husband on the front lines. She knew that she was buying time. She knew that there wasn't going to be, but she, she wrote a letter. She sent it off, and she waited. The end of that month came. There were no ration cards and no check from the government that came in the mail. My grandmother was desperate because her husband was serving his country. He had been a pastor, but they were living from month to month with those checks. They did not have money, and you couldn't buy food without money and the ration cards. She didn't have either. So at that week, during, during her her, um, their, their church's prayer meeting on Wednesday night, she shared the prayer request with the church. She says, I haven't received my check this month, and I have not received. And there was a young, an older family there that owned a grocery store, members of their church, and they said, Sister Hazel, don't worry, we will take care of you until you receive your check. You come to us, we will give you the food you need for this month. It's not a problem. So this family, this wonderful family, their name were the Geislers, they provided food for my family. When the end of that second month came, there was no check in the mail. And there was no response from her husband. And the family helped out again. Three months went by. When the fourth month came and there was no check in the mail, the family came to my grandmother and said, I'm sorry, we have no more money. We've used up all, all of our savings we cannot provide you with any more food. We don't have anything left to give you. We want to, but we can't. And my grandmother, now very frustrated with three children at home, wrote a very pointed letter to her husband. Not against him at all, but just she hadn't heard back from him, and she knew the circumstances. It wasn't. She said, Dear, I cannot understand. You are serving your country with your best of abilities, and we are here at home, and they're not keeping their end of things. I'm not receiving the check that you're earning every month. I'm not receiving anything. I'm not receiving, and I don't know whether we're going to survive. We don't have any food. She sent that in the mail, and the next day, there was a loud knock on the door. Another man, dressed just like the first man some months earlier, was standing there, simply handed Kurt a letter, give this to your mother, and he walked away. And Kurt gave it to my grandmother. My grandmother opened the letter, and in the letter she read, and her face turned white. She said, children, we all need to come together and pray now. It was a summons to the headquarters of the Nazi party in the city of Frankfurt, which is one of the largest cities in Germany, the banking capital of, of Germany. And that's the equivalent, maybe, you could say, of being summoned to the chief of police because the, the, the Nazi headquarters in Germany was also the headquarters for the Gestapo, the secret police. And everybody knew that this was a very, very serious thing because people who would be summoned to this building often were never seen again. Nobody knew what happened to them. They didn't want to think about what happened to them. Maybe some knew what happened to them, but nobody, nobody knew. My grandmother knew this was a very serious thing. She had been summoned to the so-called brown building. And I don't know if this is it or not. I just put a brown building from Europe up. It's kind of brown, isn't it? I'm honest with you. I've been looking for this brown building. I've been looking through archives on the Internet and stuff. I haven't found it. It was a secret place, evidently. Anyway, so she had, she had an invitation to this, to this place uh, the next Monday. And she was to meet with the director of the entire Nazi party, who was also the director of Gestapo, in that city. Wow. Okay. So children, this is what we're going to do. You're not going to go to school on Monday. You're going to stay home. You're going to wait for me to come back. We're going to pray about this all weekend long. You're not going to go to school on Monday. You're going to stay at home quiet. You're not going to make a single noise because the Halabas live in this, in this block and they're Nazi uh, members and they spy, as you know, on our entire building, all the families here. 
So you cannot make a noise. For you to be home and not in school is suspicious. You cannot have any suspicion. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make arrangements with church members and family members. You're not going to know anything about it except your arrangements. But I'm going to make specific arrangements for each one of you to go your separate way. If I don't return by such and such a time, let's say it was 12 o'clock. I'm making that up. You're going to go in five-minute increments, and you're going to go take this Tra this um, um, tram to this tram to this tram to meet somebody secretly that will take you off into safety somewhere because the last thing I want to do if I disappear is for you to be taken by the government and put in brainwashing schools and I do not want that to happen to you. You are going to be safe with church members and with family. But I don't want, if one of you are caught, I don't want you to be tempted to lie about where your brother or sister is. So I'm not going to tell you where each of you are. You won't know. It will protect you, and it will protect each other, and it will keep you safe so that you can also keep God's commandments. I want you to be faithful in this, and don't tell each other where you're going. So one by one, when the day came, my grandmother called them into the kitchen. Kurt went first. She gave him the instructions. When he came back in the living room, my little, my dad, who was very young, I want you to imagine, you're about eight years old. You're the youngest, and you may never see your mother again, and father is who knows where. You haven't heard from him in months. You may not even be alive anymore. So Kurt comes back in the living room. What did mom say? Where are you going? What, what, what are the plans? I can't tell you. Remember the arrangement, Gat. Can't tell you where I'm going. Lotta, you're next. So Lotta goes in. Lotta gets her instructions. She comes back out. Lotta, you got to tell me. I need to know where are you going? Gat, it's your turn. We cannot tell each other where we're going. Go talk to mom. My dad was given three different trams to take until a certain stop, and there he was going to meet his Aunt Anna. And when he came out, I'm not going to tell you either. Not that they asked. I'm not going to tell you either. It's a secret between me and mom and God. Yes, that's right, Gat. You don't tell anybody the arrangements. And on Monday morning then, with, after many prayers, after tears, my grandmother left for the brown house, not knowing if she'd ever see her family again. By the way, among the kids, my dad told me this, among the kids there was a rumor that there were door handles going into the building but there were no door handles on the inside to get out. It's how kids, I guess, process these sinister places, maybe. So my grandmother goes, and the kids wait at home, and they wait at home, and they wait at home. Behind the sheer curtains, they're looking at it as every tram comes up the street, wanting to see if Mom is on that tram. Mom went in the morning. She says, if I don't come back by noon, you're going to go each in your separate ways in five-minute increments. And, and, and the time ticked by, and the children were getting more and more anxious, quietly watching, quietly waiting. It was 11.15, and there was no tram. There was a tram, but there was no mom. It was 11.30, there was a tram, but there was no mom. It was 11.45, there was a tram, but there was no mom. One more tram left. And as that last tram came, they saw one pair of legs, because there was a tree kind of blocking their view from the tram to their place. There was one pair of legs moving much more quickly than the other legs. And they, of course, recognized the walk of their mom. Hooray, mom is home. Shh, the holobox upstairs. We were so quiet, quiet. And mom came in the house. And there was great, great hugging and great rejoicing. And then my grandmother said, I need to tell you now what just happened. God is amazing. What happened? I arrived, she says. I was ushered into a waiting room, and there I waited. I waited, and I waited, and I waited. My appointment was early in the morning, but it, the time went past. Hours went by. I was worried about you, but I waited. There was nobody, and you don't ask, so I just waited. And then, she says, I was finally called for my appointment many hours later. And she says, I arrived to this very plush, beautiful office. She says it was the most beautiful room I've ever seen in my life, 
other than maybe some of the big churches, but she says there were Persian carpets piled up on the floors. There was mahogany paneled walls all around. There were paintings of the masters hanging in this room. There was a huge mahogany desk, and behind that desk sat a man. By the way, that's my grandmother. Those are the three kids. That's their building, their apartment building. It's still standing today. That's my dad, first day of school, first grade. I could tell you more stories. They couldn't go to church, school on Sabbath. That was another interesting experience. This was not the man that was sitting behind the desk, but this was a picture I found of a man sitting behind the desk that might have been the man sitting behind the desk. You understand? So for illustration purposes, let's just say this is the man. You see the armband I described earlier? There was a man sitting behind the desk, and when my grandmother came in, he stood up, and he welcomed her, and he said, uh, Sister, uh, not sister, he said, uh, Frau Hasel, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please have a seat. My grandfather, mother said, I, I prefer to remain standing. Okay. Well, and he opened up a file in front of him, and he said, uh, tell me, why do you think you're here today? My grandmother thought, well, I could say a number of things, but maybe honesty is the best way of going about this. So she says, I think I know why I'm here today. She says, I, I've been thinking about this, and I believe I'm here because uh, several months ago I was invited to join the Nazi party with my husband. And um, four months have passed, and I have not heard from him, and I believe that that is why I'm here today. He said, yes. And then from that file... He took out two envelopes and he handed it to my grandmother and he says, do you recognize these? And they were the two letters that she had sent to her husband. And my grandmother became a little, how should you say, had a little righteous indignation. And she said, what are you doing with these letters? These are private letters that I've sent to my husband on the front lines. He says, in this regime, there are no private letters. Your government needs to know everything. And let me tell you, how dare you write what you wrote in the second letter to your husband? How dare you tell him that your government is not taking care of you at home? How dare you spread rumors on the front lines, demoralizing the troops? Why would you not join the Nazi party? And he got very aggravated, and he started raising his voice, and there were veins popping out in his neck. And he says, why would you refuse to join the party that has given this country everything? Why do you refuse to join? And there was a pause as he had a pause for breath. And my grandmother was able to say very calmly, she says, sir, it is very simple. I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I believe that there is a God that exists in heaven. And I cannot join an atheistic party that refuses to acknowledge that God. I will never join this party because I believe in God. And he stopped for a moment. And he says, who did you say you were? What, what, what did you say earlier? You're, you're a what? She says, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Yes, that's what I thought you heard. I heard. Now tell me, uh, which church do you belong to? And now my grandmother was a little nervous, you know. Because she didn't want to rat out on any of her fellow church members. And he, she said, uh, well, no, tell me. And she said, okay. So she told, her, he told, her, she told him the, the church, East Ridge Seventh-day Adventist Church. No, not really. But <laughs> told, her the name of the, told him the name of the church. And, and when she told him the name of the church, he picked up a phone on his desk. I like to think that there were six phones on his desk. And one was a red phone, and he picked up the red phone. But that's just my imagination. I, I don't know. He picked up the phone on his desk. He says, please check if uh, Mrs. Helena Hazel is a member of this church here in the city of Frankfurt. And he hung up the phone. And he was just staring at her as he, she stared back at him quietly. And now there was kind of a smile creeping across his face. It wasn't a sarcastic smile. It wasn't an evil kind of smile. It was actually a pleasant smile. The, the blood was you know, coming kind of coming out of his face again. He was kind of calming down. And a few seconds later, the phone rang. He picked it up. He says, uh-huh, yes, okay, thank you. He hung up. He says, it's just been a confirm that you're a member of that church. Now tell me something. Do you know the Miller family? Now my grandmother was again cautious because she knew the Miller family, but she did not want to 
give any indication or get the Miller family in trouble. They were a wonderful family. And, but the man by this time was smiling ear to ear. Do you know the Miller family? And my grandmother thought, well, maybe I'll take a risk. She said, yes, I do. I know them very well. I've known them for many years. You see, my husband is the pastor of the church, but as he's serving his country, um, you know, the Millers, he's, he's retired and wasn't able to be drafted into the army, and they're the elders that are running the church. He's the head elder of the church, and he's, they're a wonderful family. Oh, yes, he said, they are a wonderful family. And my grandmother said, excuse me? Oh, yes, I know the Millers very well. You see, my, my wife and I, we have just moved into a new place, a new home, and the Millers happen to be our neighbors. They have been the most wonderful neighbors that we have ever experienced in our married lives together. In fact, the Millers have been so friendly. They've invited us over for dinner several times. They have brought to our home fresh baked bread to, uh, uh, to welcome us into the neighborhood. We have never had such wonderful neighbors as the Millers. And they're Seventh-day Adventists. They told us that. And you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Interesting. And he looked at my grandmother, and now my grandmother was smiling too. And then after a few seconds of contemplation, he closed the folder in front of him. And he said, Frau Hazel, I'm so sorry that our office disturbed you here today. We often have to deal with different situations in my line of work. But I can assure you that you will not be disturbed by this office again. I have full jurisdiction in this matter, and this case is closed. We will send you the four checks of your last four months that we have withheld from you. You will get all your ration cards, he says, and you are free to go. And my grandmother turned around, headed to the door, which had a handle on the inside. And as she was turning the handle of the door, he said, oh, by the way, Frau Hasel, I need to tell you something. I'm not the man that you were scheduled to meet with today. I'm sorry for the delay and your long wait. The director of this office became violently ill this morning and couldn't come in. But I'm the associate director, and I will have full jurisdiction of this matter, and I assure you that this office will never disturb you again. You're free to go. And my grandmother left rejoicing in the promises of the Lord. You know, as I've contemplated over this favorite story of mine over the years, I have been very, very thankful for two things. I've been thankful for faithful parents and grandparents who stand for right, though the heavens fall. I'm thankful for a grandmother who was honest and open and who stood up for her beliefs. And I'm thankful for the Miller family, who regardless of the situation around them, not knowing who their neighbors were, not knowing that he was one of the top Gestapo agents in the entire city of Frankfurt, befriended their new neighbors without any preconceived ideas, without any pretenses whatsoever, but just treated them as neighbors should. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Miller family. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my grandmother. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a faithful God who is faithful in all things. The three children were reunited with their mother, and when the war ended, they were reunited with their father. When the war ended, of the original 1,200 men in that particular unit, that unit had been replaced four times in the course of those six years. That means about 5,000 men went through that unit on the front lines. And of the original 1,200, only seven survived. Only three of them were never wounded during those six years. And my grandfather was one of them, together with the 
commanding officer, and the cook. But that's another story you'll have to invite me back for some other time. As he was released from war, from, his, from the war at the end of the war, these are his discharge papers signed by Paul E. Carliner, captain, American captain. My grandfather was asked something interesting. He was asked why, as he was looking through his papers, were you court-martialed during the war? And my grandfather said, well, it's very simple. You're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you the story. Do you really want to know? He says, yes, I want to know. But you're not going to understand it. And he said, tell me. He says, well, I, I keep the seventh-day Sabbath, and I have kept the seventh-day Sabbath throughout all six years of the war. I have not worked on a single Sabbath. But I received a new officer. I had made arrangements with preceding officers that I would work on Sunday and other days, but on Sabbaths I would have Sabbath off. But this particular officer didn't understand my arrangement, gave me a very direct order to work on the Sabbath, and I refused that order, and I was court-martialed to go on to trial after the war ended. That's why I was court-martialed, and the man's face just dropped as he was hearing my my grandfather telling him the story. And finally, he blurted out, are you a Jew serving in the German army? (laughs) And my grandfather said, no, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister, but we keep Sabbath the same way Jews do from Friday night at sundown till Saturday night at sundown. Sabbath evening at sundown, we keep the same Sabbath. And by God's grace, I've been able to keep every single Sabbath for six years except there was one Sabbath, he says, as we were coming back as quickly as we could um, from the front lines after the war was over. The days got kind of mixed up, and I think I kept the Sabbath because I don't, we've lost track of time. I think I kept the Sabbath. I've been praying about it ever since, and I hope, I hope God will forgive me if it was a different day, but I think it was the Sabbath. But every other Sabbath I have kept faithfully, and this man was just, this man... Captain Carolina was just blown away. He says, let me tell you something. He says, I'm an American Jew, and I have not kept a single Sabbath during these war years. You are a better Jew than I am. Tell me, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor, I told you. I see. And where do you pastor? In Frankfurt, Germany. I see. Do you have, do you have, any, do you have a farm? No, I I live in the city. Frankfurt, hello? Well, yes, I know, but do you have a farm? Do you have any farming experience? They were letting the farmers out first because it was May and and the people needed to get out to the fields to make sure that the fields would... Do you have have any farming experience whatsoever? My grandfather says, yes, I grew up in one of the largest farms in southern Germany. My grandfather owned a huge, huge farm. Oh, yes, excellent. And do you by any chance right now have a little garden or something, even though you live in the city. Well, yeah, we have a little plot of land. I mean, it's, you know, it's about five meters by five meter little plot of land. I mean, right behind our apartment, everybody kind of gets a little plot of land. Perfect, that's excellent. He began to write, handed his discharge papers to my grandfather and says, you are released to work in the vineyard of the Lord. Have a wonderful experience. And my grandfather was the first Seventh-day Adventist minister after the war to be back on active duty. You see, God is able to be with us even in the most trying circumstances. He is able to be with us even when we have no hope. That's my dad, and that's his brother, Kurt. They're about 23 and 18 in that picture. Kurt never immigrated to this country. He was a pastor for most of his life in Germany. My dad came at the age of 22 to this country, married my mother, which was a wonderful thing because that's why um, I'm here today. I'm very thankful for that. And these are my grandparents as I knew them growing up as they were retired in this black forest in southern Germany. Uh, My grandmother is standing here. It's very unusual that she's standing because normally she would not be standing. She had rheumatoid arthritis the last 40 years of her life and I knew her mostly as a cripple, barely walking with a walker, and then later completely bedridden at the end of her life. This is one of my favorite pictures of the family. My dad is on the left. Susie, who wrote the book, is there. Lutta is in yellow. Kurt is um, in the suit on the 
sorry, my dad was on the left, Kurt is on the right, and with their parents. Isn't heaven going to be a wonderful place when we can all see each other again, smiling, happy, rejoicing, not in what we have done, but what the Lord has done? And we have a great promise, and it's a promise that was hanging outside I'm sorry, just inside the door of my uh, family's home there in Frankfurt, Germany. It hung there during the entire six years of the war. It was a little plaque with these words from Matthew chapter 28. The last words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Do you believe that Jesus is with us today? Do you believe that in the time in which we live, Michael will one day stand up again and is standing up? He will deliver his people. That's what Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 tells us. And we have the promise, let us not focus on the crisis, let us focus on Christ, our Redeemer. For he is standing in front of the throne of God right now. God is still seated on his throne. He's not going anywhere. He knows all that is going on. He knew it would go on from the beginning, and he knows what will take place in the future. We can trust in him as we are going through these times today. And we can have peace because he is the God that gives us that peace. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are to you because you are a gracious God. You are an amazing God, a God who delivers even in the snare of the most difficult circumstances. You are a God who is able to provide when we have no provision. You are able to see possibilities. You have a thousand possibilities when we have see only impossibilities. Lord, you are able to do what we are not able to do. And so we trust in you. We place our lives in your hands again today. And we ask for you to guide us as only you can. Through the vicissitudes of this end time world in which we live, we know it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be true. And thank you for standing by our side and walking before us as we walk with you to the promised land that you have promised for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.